If you want to redesign your garden, it can cost a lot. But I'm Alexandra from the Middle Size Garden YouTube channel and blog, and I've been interviewing top garden designers for years now. And so I've pulled together their best budget-friendly tips to save you money if you're doing any landscaping in your garden. BBC Gardener's World presenter Adam Frost says, think of a word that can sum up your garden. That makes a lot of sense because if you're trying to save money, you're probably buying furniture and plants and even perhaps redesigning the garden over a number of years rather than doing it all at once. So when you're in the garden centre and thinking, is this going to be the right table? Think, does it fit into the word that I've used to encompass my garden? And that word could be calm, contemporary, romantic, colourful, seaside, whatever you prefer. And garden designer Arit Anderson, who's also a presenter on BBC Gardener's World, says you should start with a tree. Now, a tree can be quite an expensive investment in a garden. So buy a very young tree, because that will be cheaper and it will establish better. But the other thing you could do is to look at the trees that are already there. It may be a tree you don't like and it may be too big, but it may be better to have it reshaped or pruned professionally so that it will look more like the tree you want than to chop it all down and then to plant a new tree, which may or may not get established. Top garden designer Charlotte Rowe says design off the house. What she means by this is that you stand at your door as you're going to go into your garden and you look at the views you'll have from there when you're deciding what to have in your garden. Or look out of your windows and see what you want to see and then position things or create focal points from there. Charlotte also says that it's absolutely essential to measure incredibly carefully and the smaller your garden is, the more important it is to measure very accurately because if you get the measurements just a few millimetres wrong and you're trying to fit something into a very tight space, you may actually waste the money that you spent buying it. And Charlotte's third tip is that your boundaries need to look smart. Now, if you've got a tatty old fence and you can't afford to replace it, she suggests that you paint it black because that's a very good background for plants and it will look smarter. Another good tip is to pick a signature colour for your garden. So you may have all sorts of bits of different furniture and different things that have been bought at different times that don't really pull together. But if you paint everything in a signature colour, like this smart mustard yellow or blue, then it can look as if your whole garden somehow fitted together. Reuse as much as you can. One of the big costs on landscaping is having materials taken away. So when garden designer and British Bake Off finalist Jane Beadle redesigned her garden, instead of having landscapers take away the paving from the old terrace, she had it broken up and put into gabions. And they make a wonderful wildlife home and they look really smart and contemporary. And look at upcycling in every possible way. For example, the owners of this seaside house thought that the concrete paths were really ugly, but instead of taking them up, they actually just knocked a little bit more of the concrete out and then they filled in with little bits of brick and pottery to make an attractive design. And you can also upcycle garden furniture. Any furniture that will do well outside, and that includes quite often metal or glass office furniture, will be fine as garden furniture. And you can find office furniture incredibly cheaply in second-hand sales or on eBay or something like that. Because I think that this garden shows that you can actually use office chairs and office tables outside just as much as you can use garden furniture. And you can use all sorts of materials for recycling if you're creating things like bug hotels as well. So just look at anything and think, well, will this survive in the garden? That's really all you have to ask yourself. And definitely look at buying secondhand garden furniture. Some of it may have got very old, so check that it is going to be sound. You don't want to buy furniture that's going to fall apart, but you will always find that secondhand is usually a bit cheaper than new. So how about saving money on pots and planters? The first thing to know is that large pots are better and easier to maintain than lots of smaller ones. Smaller pots dry out very quickly and you'll need to keep watering absolutely every day. So it is better to put your money into one or two really large planters rather than buying lots of little pots. I've often found that sales or slightly flawed pots are much cheaper. And if you buy cheap pots from a garden centre or supermarket, you can paint them in your garden's signature colour and they will automatically look much more special. 
I've actually bought a large stoneware pot with a firing crack in it and all I do it was much much cheaper it cost literally a tenth of what it would have cost if I'd spent the full money for it but the firing crack doesn't affect how it performs in frost so I just turn the crack away from the house and nobody notices it when you're buying pots, do check that they're frostproof because it will waste money if you buy a beautiful pot and then it cracks as soon as you get cold weather in the first winter. So what about saving money on garden lighting? Well, electrical cables do have to be laid by law by experienced and qualified electricians. Or if you really are a very expert DIYer, then you still have to usually consult your local buildings control. But if you're doing a big revamp of the garden, it makes a lot of sense to lay electrical cabling. The cheap way around is to use solar lighting. And solar lighting can look very pretty, but it won't give you the same effect as proper garden lighting, which is, say, for instance, throws up into trees or lights, steps and things like that. Solar lighting is either individual lights which have little panels or it's a string of lights with a little panel. But both of those little panels have to be in full sun for most of the day to, to recharge. And of course, that means that in the winter, when there's much less sun in the Northern Hemisphere or in the South of the Southern Hemisphere, it doesn't recharge so well. And therefore the lights don't go on for as long. And can you save money on garden sheds? Well, the debate you will have is whether to repair and paint your old garden shed or to buy a new one. And repairing a garden shed can be surprisingly expensive, but it's never going to cost as much as buying new. If you are buying new, make sure that you buy a really good base. A concrete or brick base will be more stable than an earth base or a wood base which may rot. And if the base is stable, then the shed will last longer. And what about your garden pond? Well, the cheapest way to create a garden pond is to dig a hole in the garden, to add a plastic liner and to anchor it down with bricks or rocks. Or you can convert a barrel or a trough to make a mini wildlife pond. You don't need expensive water features. And probably the thing that will save you the most money is perhaps looking at what you can do yourself. My friend garden designer Posy Gentles learned bricklaying to make the base of this garden shed herself. She did get an expert to finish it off. And there's a huge amount of advice now online and on YouTube. Check a number of different videos and to really think about, is this a job I could do? Do I feel that the way they're explaining it is clear? Make sure that you take any health and safety advice very seriously. But you can find that, for instance, when it comes to laying a gravel path, or laying pavers or bricklaying, that you can do quite a lot of it yourself. And if you want to save money on garden paths, then you can mow a garden path, or you can simply lay mulch down on your garden path. Both of these are very, very cheap path methods. Now, obviously, mulch will need replenishing and you'll need to re-mow. But actually, it'll give you a very good idea as to where you really want your garden path to be. So maybe in a few years time, you can save up and have an expensive garden path laid with beautiful stone. But you'll really know that that's where you want it and that's how you want it to go. And here are some tips from the garden designers themselves, which will help you design your garden, no matter what your budget is. Coming to a space like Kew Gardens or any of the wonderful grand gardens in the UK, they are so inspiring. Um, First and foremost, it's about getting out into the wider space. And sometimes when our own garden, we can feel a little bit overwhelmed, what to do next, you know, making the right choice and really worried about that, that, that small patch of that in our, in our backyard. But by coming to a larger space, immediately you can breathe and relax. And then you can start taking in the uh, view of what you're seeing. I like to look in vignettes if you like. I kind of, first of all, I might want to look at, you know, waterside plants, if that's what my interest is in. Um, often there'll be a place to see shady plants. There might be a really naturalistic space. So you can start to break it down and identify an area that could just maybe be your patch, could just be your garden. We wanted a space which we wanted to enjoy for 365 days of the year. So uh, we first looked at all the exit points and where all the windows were. And once you know that is, you get these sort of sight lines. But we wanted to also divide the space up. So it's just under an acre, 
but we wanted to sort of divide it up so it makes you feel like there's more of it. And that's a really good little trick. If you want to have more, if it makes a space feel bigger, sort of break it up into sort of little rooms in a way. I thought about how I would use the garden and what we needed from it. And basically we needed somewhere lovely to sit, somewhere we could, we could retreat to for a cup of coffee and somewhere I could pack full of plants as well. And we've got a tiny space, it's only 52 feet long. Um, what I tried to do is to give myself separate rooms, but I didn't want to block them off with something solid. I wanted still to be able to see through. So I've got a couple of miscanthus, um, but then I've added Verbena bonariensis because you get the wonderful height and movement, but actually you can still see through them. The verbena just breaks the view of the seating area. And actually, surprisingly, when you're in the seating area, you feel really quite enclosed. If you look at the top 50 plants 50 years ago and look at the list now, there is very little change. What I would say now is that, again, it's gone full circle. So shrub, shrubs are coming back with a vengeance, thank goodness. I think people have suddenly realised that if you do an entire perennial bed, it is absolutely marvellous from March, April on till July. And after that, everything starts to die back or it's done its bit. I mean, obviously, you've got the, the winter structure of grasses and stuff. But there's a midsummer lull where without some form of structure that's permanent, it can look a bit flat and look a, a complete mess. I mean, everyone always says that a huge part of gardening is nostalgia. When you, when you think back, when you, when you show people stuff or people smell stuff, they say, oh, I remember my grandmother had that or my mum had that. And I think that's why those, those particular plants are always desirable. There are two psychological problems, or two types of psychological problems in the garden. The first are people who won't allow themselves to fail. A rather bigger problem is the people who think gardening is about controlling the garden, controlling nature. Uh, making it happen. And the truth is, most of the time, you are part of the thing that is happening. It is happening. And you're steering it. You're tweaking it. But most of us like to think we are a conductor of a magnificent horticultural orchestra. In fact, we're much more like the janitor putting out the chairs and turning off the lights. I'm sorry about the audio in that last clip. I met Monty Don at the launch of his book Down to Earth and there was a bit of a party going on around us. But I thought it would be good to hear from him that we shouldn't be afraid to try things in the garden. It doesn't matter if we fail. All plant people always tell me they have killed thousands of plants. And also that we're not in charge in our garden. Actually, nature's in charge. Nature's in charge and we can have a lovely garden if we just let it grow, which I think is a very reassuring message. There are links to the designers in the description below and to other useful resources. And if you've enjoyed this, please hit like, because then I'll know you'd like more garden design videos. And if you'd like tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden, subscribe to the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.